Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes. They have a shovel in their hands. They have a shovel in their hands. 
And they stop at our church and they start digging up our plants that we worked real hard on mm -hmm. a couple weeks ago. They start digging up these plants. And uh, it just made me, it made me realize the reality that we are in. The reality of the world that we're living in. We have a generation that has no respect for, for, for the church. We, we have a generation that has no respect for each other. A generation that literally is losing uh, to the world. That is losing to the world. Jim, Jim told, us, uh, told me a story Wednesday about a time when he was actually trying to witness to a bunch of kids. And he was telling them, you know, do you know who Jesus is? And they didn't even know who Jesus was. They didn't even know who Jesus was. The Bible tells us to go and tell all the nations, but yet in Fountain, Kentucky, there are kids who don't know who Jesus is. My mom told me this week that she was uh, speaking to this kid, and, and the kid said, Miss Karen, guess where I was at yesterday? Mom said, well, where were you? She said, we went to the, to the food church. The food church. She said, oh, that's great. Do you know what they do at that church? They feed us. She said, that's not the only thing they do at the church, you know you know what else they do at, at, do at church? No, no, no. We just go, all we do is we go and eat food. That's what people think. Peter and Andrew, two disciples of Jesus, they, they specialized in feeding people, right? They, they were fishers, fishermen. They, they went and they, they caught the fish so people could eat. But Jesus said, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Church, we have to start feeding a generation on God's word. Those kids that came to Terrible Church this week, right, they don't need free food. They don't need free handouts. They need to know why we are here today celebrating Jesus. Why we're inside this church. They need to understand that truth. That God loved them enough to send his son to die for them. And on the third day he rose. So you wouldn't have to pay for the sins that you made. So that you can have a life anew. This is why we put so much time and effort and money into our ministries. Because of what Christ did for us. So you don't have to feel worthless. So you don't have to feel ashamed. So you don't have to feel tired. This morning I'm going to ask you to release your rest. Because what Christ did for us is he allowed us to fully enter in to God's rest. Not only in the here and now, but forever and ever. Amen. So let's all stand for the reading of God's holy word. Acts chapter 10, verses 30, 34 through 43. Acts chapter 10. Verses 34 through 43. Opening his mouth, Peter said, I most certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but in every nation the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. The word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee, after the baptism which John proclaimed, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God appointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. He also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all people, but to witnesses who were chosen before him by God. That is to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. He ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of our sins. Let us pray. Dear and gracious Father God, we thank you, God, for this opportunity to be able to gather in your house. God, I thank you for the opportunity to allow me to preach your word this morning. God, I pray that you remove any distractions and, and any disturbances in this place and allow the Holy Spirit to flood this church this morning. Pray right now, God, that you put your anointing on this message. For everything that you got, do, God, I, I pray that we lift our hands and surrender to you always. It's in God's name. It's in Jesus' name I, I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You may be seated. I want to preach to you this morning about the fact that there is power in the blood. We truly have victory in Jesus. That everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of their sins. In this passage this morning, Peter is giving a sermon. And he's telling those who he is preaching to that Jesus didn't just come for the Jews. He didn't just come for the Gentiles. But he came for everybody. He came for everybody. 
He came to save us all. This was a lesson that Peter himself had to grasp in his own life. He, he says here, he starts off his sermon by saying, I certainly understand now that God is not one to show partiality, but Jesus came for everyone. Growing up in, in gym class, you know, you always had to pick teams, you know, for, for games and stuff. And so you'd have to pick person, and, and you never wanted to be the last person picked because then you felt a little embarrassed, you know. It never happened to me. I was the first one picked. Team captain, I was the one doing the picking. But you, but you don't want to be the last one picked. It's embarrassing. And then the team that chooses you, you're really embarrassed because you're like, the only reason they're picking me is because I'm the last one and they had to, you know. And uh, when it comes to us as Christians, we don't have to have that feeling. That is a feeling that we should never feel when it comes to God. Because God chose you. God wants you. God has opened arms of grace to you. All you have to do is receive it. Let me ask you this morning, have you ever been so worried and stressed and upset that you lost sleep? That you lost, I, I had a job that I, I, I hated this job so much that I literally, I literally would, would go to bed on, on Sunday nights and I would not get any sleep because I was dreading waking up on Mondays. I was dreading going in to work on Mondays. You know? That's nothing against Walmart. <laughs> I'm, <just kidding. laughs> I'm gonna get you there, my goodness. But that's where we're at. I have had jobs where I literally couldn't sleep because I was so worried and stressed. But because of what Christ did on the third day, he opened us, he opened us the doors to enter into God's rest. For us to realize our rest and enter into God's rest. But listen, we'll never be able to enter into that rest. If we don't trust his promise, the promise that he came for us, the promise that he died for us, and the promise that he rose for us. Peter starts off by saying, in every nation, the man who fears him and does what is right is welcome to him. Christ came for us. I was watching this montage video of people, and they were asking, they were, they were interviewing them, and they were saying, you know, why do you think Jesus came to this earth? And it was very interesting that the, the answers were all over the place, but one of, the, one of the most common things that I thought was encouraging was it seemed like everybody admitted that Jesus was real. They admitted that he was a, a real person. From there, then it started going all over the place. Well, you know, he came to start a revolution inside the church, you know. Or, or somebody said he, he came to, you know, show us what morals are. And, and, and if you're going to start a revolution inside the church, going to the cross and dying, that's probably not the best, best way to do it, you know. I, <coughs> And ethics. Jesus didn't just come down for ethics. He didn't just come down for moral reasons. When we don't understand why Jesus came, and it takes us in all sorts of wrong directions. But Jesus told us why he came in Luke 19. He tells Zacchaeus, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Matthew 20, Jesus says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came for the sick. Jesus came not to call the righteousness, but to call sinners to repentance. Jesus also said he didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. Amen. When the scribes and the Pharisees brought the adulterous woman to see Jesus and, and they were going to test him for a response, Jesus says he was that without sin throw the first stone. And when nobody did it, Jesus says, I didn't come to condemn you, woman, but go and sin no more. Jesus Christ came for us. You know, I, I, I mentioned this morning, I take dying eggs very seriously. It is one of my passions. If you, if, you know, because some people just put that, we get, we get the whole cups and the dye. We do the whole nine yards. And I can sit there, and I take, it takes me forever to dye them, but I'll do designs on them, and I'll, I'll turn the egg into a certain form so that when I get it to the dye, you know, and it comes out, it's like a, it's amazing. I could probably make a unicorn with dye color. That's how good I am. You got magic crayons and you can, these magic crayons, you can draw on it. It looks invisible. You draw on it, then you start dying, and then it comes out this beautiful masterpiece. I am, I am a scholar when it comes to dying eggs. I'll have to, to show you all some pictures sometime. I should have brought some pictures today and posted them up. They're, I'm good at it. My brother, Aaron, he literally, I'm sitting there. He showed, he sent us these, these uh, videos of him and his daughter, and they're, they're doing, they're dying eggs, is what he called it. He said he's dying eggs. I'm going to tell you what he did. He, there's this thing where you stick this egg on this contraption, and it spins the egg. Okay, real fun, real nice, great. Then you take a marker, 
And you just put the marker up against the egg and it spins and so it then makes creation. That's not dying eggs. Okay? That's cheating is what that calls. That's cheating. Okay? We don't cheat in my family. We die eggs the real way. My wife bought this. I'm, just, I'm going way off topic, but my wife brought this contraption that holds the eggs together, holds the eggs in together, so that the boys don't drop the eggs in the thing. I said that's not dying eggs, because you're cheating. You gotta have the egg dipper. It's a long process. <laughs> it's a long process. But I take dying eggs very, very uh, serious. It might be one of the most important things I do during Easter. Dying eggs. And preaching a sermon. But I die those eggs. I take it very seriously. I really do. But let me tell you something. I do it for my own personal reasons. When Jesus dies, he didn't do it for personal things, right? He did it for us. He died for us. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 says, But we do see him who was made for a little while lower than the angels, namely Jesus, because of the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. As we stand at the cross of Christ, we see a glorious exhibition of God's love. Paul tells us in the Bible that while we were powerless to help ourselves, Christ died for sinful men. Because of what Christ did, we get to see the full rewards of heaven. Have you ever, have you ever seen the, the, uh, the contest, touch a car? You know, you touch a car and win the car. You have, to, you have to put your palm on the car, and whoever holds it there the longest wins that car. Have you ever seen this? In 2017 or something, th these two contestants literally did this for three days straight. Three days straight, just sitting there, holding their hands on this car just to get this reward. Could you imagine waiting that long? When, when it comes to Christ, you don't have to wait for those rewards. You can be cleansed by the blood of Christ today. It can happen. It can happen right now. Yep. Every Christmas, me and Becky, we, we like to give each other presents early for each other. You know, just a little something for me and Becky. And uh, we do it every year. We start when I, I'm, a, I'm a kid at heart. I don't know if you noticed this. I'm a kid at heart. And so I like to get each other. We, get, we give each other presents. It's just the right thing to do. And uh, starting at the beginning of December, I started asking her if she's got it yet. You know, did you get my present for Christmas yet? Then I start, about halfway through December, I, I start changing that question to, can we give each other our presents early? And then I'll beg her, and normally it works. I normally get to open up my Christmas present uh, a couple weeks ahead of time. And you never believe what she did this, this Easter. A couple weeks ago, she, she asked me if she could open up her uh, chocolate early for Easter. I couldn't believe it. And she says, "Hey, my, you, you use me in my sermon. You, you, you literally use me in your sermons every week. The least you can do is give me some chocolate." <laughs> but I said, "You gotta wait. It's Easter. You gotta wait till Easter." But here's a great thing: Christ doesn't make us wait. Christ doesn't make us wait. Jesus Christ voluntarily took our place on the cross. And he died. And when he was on the cross, that on that hill, and that thief that was next to him, and he turns to Christ and says, Lord, when you get to, to your kingdom, remember me. And what does Christ do? He turns to that thief. And he says, today, today you will be with me in paradise. Not tomorrow, not in, in some far distant time, but today, he said. You can have that assurance that you will be with me in paradise. And what a paradise that will be. Where the streets are lined with gold. A glorious life that will never end. Beauty beyond words. Where there will be no sickness. Where there will be no tears. But as glorious as heaven is, the Bible tells us there's only one way to heaven. And that's through repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ who said, I am the way. Jesus Christ paid for our sins through his death on the cross. And as long as we believe in him as Lord, you will be saved. And how do we know that you believe? Because you're going to show it by your actions. You're going to show it on how you love. You're going to show it on how you treat your neighbors, how you treat God's house. Christ came for us and he Christ died for us. And this morning we can say with full assurance that Christ rose for us. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Psalms. 
Psalms chapter 24. We'll look at verse 7. Psalms 24, verse 7. This is a wonderful picture of Jesus Christ walking up to the doors of heaven. Psalms 24 says, Lift up your heads, O gates. Be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of of glory may come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Jesus Christ is alive today. He rose from the dead. He is not there. He conquered the grave. You know, there is more evidence that Jesus rose from the dead than there is that Julius Caesar even existed. There is more evidence that Jesus rose from the dead than that Alexander the Great was uh, died at the age of 33. Billy Graham said it best. He said, it is strange that historians will accept thousands of facts for which they can produce only shreds of evidence. But in the face of overwhelming evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, they cast a skeptical eye and hold intellectual doubts. Mm -hmm. See, the trouble with these people is they don't want to believe. But Jesus Christ is alive. He rose again. And he did it for us. We are commanded to repent of our sins and believe in the gospel and to seek him while he may be found. The him were you there asked the question. Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Without the risen Savior, there is no Christian faith. As the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Because of the resurrection of Christ, we can live forgiven lives. We all experience the consequences of sin, right? We, we, we experience the shame and the guilt and the embarrassment because sin destroys everything. Sin destroys everyone. For the wages of sin is death, but the resurrection means that we're unchained from the bondage of that sin. Christ on the cross yells out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He lived, he died, and he rose again so that we could be forgiven. You know, I met, I met a pastor who uh, was a, a jail minister. He'd go into these jails and witness to these, to these, to these men. And, uh, you know, they were pretty bad men too, but he witnessed them. He would go to these jails. And he, he said, said hey, you know what the hardest part of my ministry is? The hardest part of my ministry is going into churches and talking about my jail ministry. <coughs> so it was the hardest part because he says, the church people always would get upset. When I'll tell them that here's uh, these, these bad men who got their lives completely transformed and now they get saved and they're going to be in heaven with us rejoicing, they have a hard time accepting that truth. He said he, people have even walked out of his, his messages when he, when he was talking about these because they don't want to be in heaven with some of these people that he's witnessing. Christ didn't just die for your sin. So that you can go to heaven and be by yourself. He died and rose again for us all. So that we all have the opportunity to walk into his grace. Christ doesn't discriminate. We all sin and fall short of his glory. And I don't care what sin you've made in your life. What mistakes you've made in your past that you're ashamed about today. Maybe you're still dealing with those temptations this morning. His resurrection was for you. He died to save sinners. To save which was lost. Jesus Christ says in Revelation chapter 1, I am the first and the last, the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. You know, when that woman went to the tomb to anoint the dead body of Jesus on that Easter morning, they saw that it was empty, and the bedclothes were folded, and an angel was sitting there, and the angel gave those women the greatest news the world has ever heard, that he is not here. He is risen. Jesus Christ is the living at the right hand of God. We don't worship a dead Christ, but a Christ who is alive. And one of these days, he's going to come back to this earth again. Jesus was all he claimed to be. He claimed to be God, and he proved it by his miracles, and he showed it by his resurrection. Amen. Last year when I started preaching at more and more churches, I kept a journal about that process. But in the front of the journal, I, I've, I've written in these really bold letters, C-E-O. 
CEO. And I wrote these letters last, last Easter at, at a church I was at because it seemed like so many people were coming to our, our worship service. We had to do three services because we had so many people that are going to be coming to our Easter service. But we were having trouble filling the church up on Sunday mornings. So I wrote these, these letters down. CEO stands for Christmas Easter only. Those who attend Christmas and Easter only. If you're one of those people here this morning, I'm going to talk to you right now. Maybe you're a CES, Christmas, Easter, and sometimes Sunday. I don't know why you came today. Maybe it's because your mom told you to come. Maybe it's your spouse that told you to come. Maybe, maybe it's just a tradition that you've always come during Easter. But being uh, in church doesn't save anyone. But being the church will. Amen. If you didn't listen to anything I said this entire sermon, listen to this. Christ came for you. Christ died for you. And he rose again for you. Our Christ was beaten and spit on and mocked for you. He was ridiculed and stabbed and persecuted for you. And all he's asking in return is for you to come to him. When you come to Jesus Christ, you not only accept him as your Lord and Savior, but he must be your Lord of your life. You have to repent of your sins. Be willing to change the way that you're living. Jesus says, I am the way. Come to Christ and he will give you a new strength. He will give you a new power. He will give you a new joy, a new purpose for living. Every one of us has to make a choice. It's either the world and its pleasures or it's Christ. And it has to be an urgent decision because sin will give you temporary pleasures but an eternity of misery. But God can give us an eternity of peace. I met this young man last year who was going through family problems. He said, he said Abram, you don't understand what I'm going through. He's in high school. You don't understand, Abram. Eh, and he said, I said, you know what? You're right. I don't. I probably understand more than you realize. Right? I understand more than you realize. What, what, I, what I've been through in my own life. You know, growing up, we, my parents struggled financially. So there were days when we had to, where we had to eat. Literally, my, my mom would make us eat like cinnamon toast for, for breakfast. She make like a half of grilled cheese for all of us for lunch and then spam for dinner. And the next day, she would just alternate the order of our, our meals. So then we'd maybe have spam for breakfast, cinnamon for lunch, grilled cheese for dinner. And we would do that for days. Growing up, you know, we, we, you know I've dealt with racism in my life. We, we, Becky's brother, when he died of cancer, we lost everything in the flood of 97. I flunked out of college. Couldn't find a job for a year. Had to go through my, my dad having to go through prostate cancer. I've officiated uh, funerals of loved ones. I've had really bad days and I've had really good days. I've been through the storms of this life, but at the end of the day, I know where my hope comes from. My hope comes from the Lord. There's going to come a day where being absent of the body and being present with the Lord. And when that day comes, what a glorious day. Amen. What a glorious day that will be. Amen. As we begin this time of invitation, I don't know what storm you're going through in your life. I don't know where you're at with God, but He came to die for you. He came to free you from the shackles of sin. And this morning, He wants you to take that step down this aisle and make that profession of faith and say, I don't know how or why, but by faith, I'm going to receive you in my heart. If you're here and you want to be a part of our church, I, I encourage you to do that this morning. There's no greater time to be a part of a church, especially a church like Trinity that's growing and moving forward with the ministry that Jesus has given us. Maybe you're somebody here who is far from God. You need to rededicate your life. Whatever it is that God's calling you to, I pray that this morning, this Easter morning of 2019, will be the day that your entire life changes for God. Let us pray. Dear gracious Father God, we thank you this morning. We thank you, God, for what you have done for us, what you do every single day for us. We thank you for the miracles. We thank you, God, for the wake-up calls. We thank you, God, for bringing us together to fellowship, to worship. God, we don't deserve the things that you have given us in our lives. We don't even deserve to be able to go to heaven, but because you loved us so much, 
you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins. Today we can proclaim victory. Because on that third day you rose. Let us go out, God, and make a difference in our community. And make a difference in our own lives. And start to live a life that's completely, not really dedicated to you. It's in Jesus' personal name that I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.